Hey, it's Jay. I wanted to extend a special thanks to those of you who have listened and left reviews on iTunes for this podcast. We're producing this show independently, and unfortunately, that is not free. We have to pay for digital hosting space, software, equipment, websites, and travel out of our own pockets. But we'd love to keep this show going as long as possible. Please show your support for this podcast and give it life by making a donation to www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate or pledge your support by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. Thanks for your support and enjoy the show. Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 123. Gene McFall, Extreme Huntress, Hunting the Big Mountains of Idaho. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Jim Burrow from Western Stream, and you're listening to my favorite Big Buck Registry deer hunting podcast. Hey everybody, this is Stephen Fuller from The Hunting Ground. You are listening to my favorite podcast on the internet. To the Big Buck Registry, the Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hi, this is Mark Hammer from Antler Action Products, and I shot the Hammer Buck. And you're listening to my favorite deer hunting podcast, the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Welcome to the show. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hope you're having a fantastic weekend so far. I know it's early Saturday morning if you're listening to this as it just came out. I have my good friend. Dusty Phillips from Ohio, my good friend the Buckeye, on the other line. What's happening, Dusty? Oh, man, the rut's getting ready to be a full blown here in Ohio, and watch out. Big boys are going to start hitting the ground. I tell you what, if you don't see whitetails on your Facebook news feed right now, you need to get some new friends. <laughs> well, I guess i got a lot of good <laughs> friends right now. Man, they are just piling in. Although this this little warm snap, I think, might just slow things down just a tad, but then it'll be rocking right after that. Yeah, sure. I, I agree with that. And, you know, it's uh, if, you, if you're new to hunting, the next couple of weeks are prime time for get that beginner's luck and smoke a big giant whitetail. Yeah, exactly. Well, hey, we had, uh, speaking of the, the bucks that have been rolling in on our news feed, we had a call in actually a guy from Rhode Island so I'd like to play that right now. No and, kidding. Yeah, one of our one of our first call ins for this this deer season. So let's Awesome. Let's, let's hear what's it. happening in Rhode Island. Hello, my name is Scott Silva. I like to register a buck. I'm in uh Warren, Rhode Island. Actually got the deer in Bristol, Rhode Island. It's a 16 point buck. It weighed in at uh 230 pounds dressed. So I'm thinking it was a quite a big uh maybe 280 to 300 and um I also like to, the purpose of this call is to thank you guys. Uh, I uh, listened to that podcast on butchering, and um, I'll tell you, that really helped me out. I'd love to hear that guy again. That was great. Uh, I learned a lot. I've never really processed my own, and uh, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing from more, more of you guys, and uh, thanks for the for all the info. I really appreciate it, and thank you. Bye. So that's pretty cool. So we had a call-in from Scott Silver from Rhode Island. Congratulations, Scott, on your buck, and thank you so much for the compliments about the butchering podcast that we did uh, not too long ago. But uh, it's one of my favorites because I learned a lot myself on on how to more pro- appropriately dissect that animal. Yeah, congratulations, Scott, on a great buck, man. Sounds like a giant, Jay. Sounds like a giant and a Rhode Island giant to boot. So that's fantastic. I guess I got to travel south someday and see what's happening in the uh, New England state of Rhode Island. So let's let's transition, Dusty, from this side of the country to that side of the country, even beyond you, to the great state of Idaho. Yeah, it's going to be a journey that you don't want to miss out on. Yes, so if you've never been to Idaho, we were going to get a very good description from our guest, Gene McFall, who is one of the finalists from the Extreme Huntress. And uh, Gene is, I mean, we talked to her for quite a long time. She's She's one of those gals that just gets it. She's an outdoors person, 
by trade. I mean, she's out in the field every single day doing what she does for her job, but she just happens to be a phenomenal hunter of the highest caliber to the point where she's competing on a TV show. I don't think that's necessarily, you know, what we should all strive for. However, um, if you're good enough to do that, uh, that definitely sets the tone that you have some skills, you have some serious skills. And we're going to ask Jean to describe to us all the things that she puts into her hunts for muleys and elk and we're going to learn some things in this show about hunting the West, specifically Idaho, that you probably aren't going to get too much on other shows. Yeah, no doubt about that. And, you know, it's one thing, Jay, to hear a, a male voice talk about hunting, but it's extremely unique to hear a female voice lay it down and, and have some factual information to take your hunt to the next level. So that's very cool. Yeah, she is for real. So without further ado, here's Gene McFall. Gene McFall, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. What's happening? Hi, thanks. Sitting over here in Idaho and in the middle of this extreme hunters competition, um, enjoying some freshly killed elk meat that I just shot on Saturday and living life. Just shot on Saturday. That's excellent. Now, what are you, what are you uh, drinking with that? Well, typically with my wild meat, I do like some red wine, but right now I've got a 90 shilling uh ipa ale here Ooh. which is pretty good too yeah that sounds pretty yummy i love ipas especially this time of year i don't know it's not necessarily my summer drink but like the, the greatest part about this yeah it's like she told us she went on a run before we started the show jay so she's drinking a cold <laughs> beverage after a run <laughs> that's a woman right there yeah, the, you know, well, I the next about extreme hunters. Protein shake, but mm-hmm. the beer looked way better than a protein shake. So this is my recovery drink. You know, I have to replace my carbs from Absolutely. my run. Absolutely, I love a good beer after a hard workout. It's just <laughs> just one of my favorite things to do. Exactly. You know, I don't want it like a glass of milk or anything like that. I want a beer. Yeah, so I'm I'm down with that. Absolutely. So you're in this uh, extreme hunters competition. Tell us about that. How'd you get started in that? Well, I've watched the show for a couple years now and I've known about it. I've admired the women that are in it. And I decided to submit an essay. Actually, I was on a long flight and my little boy next to me had his iPad. So I had some time to kill and I was I knew about the contest, so I decided, "Oh, what the heck, I'll write my 500-word essay." And I just started writing and by the time my plane landed, I had it written. And I submitted it, and it was more of my story of um, what hunting means to me and why I think it can be important for women to get out. And uh, I ended up being one of the 20 semifinalists, which surprised the hell out of me, actually. But there I was, and then I had to go through the month of May. We had vote eliminations to get us down to six people that were qualified to go to Texas. And then come July, we had a week in Texas where we competed and, uh, we would hunt in the mornings and the evenings and in the afternoons, we would do some skills competitions. It was a lot of fun. It sounds very interesting. Now you're hanging out with Larry Weissoon, is that correct? Oh yeah. Mr. Whitetail. He's fantastic. (laughs) I had a lot of fun with Larry. That white beard, it just sticks out. You can't miss the guy. Yeah. It's a little hard to camouflage, but that's okay. He was, he was great to have around. He's like six five or something. I mean, he's tall. He is. Yep, yeah, he is tall, but uh, he knows how to be quiet in the bush, which is a very important skill when you have five people following you on your hunts, which is brand new to me because I do a lot of hunting solo, and now I have a camera crew and Larry and another partner with me. But no, Larry was fantastic to have around. He he was a lot of fun. I got along well with him. Yeah, he's a good guy. We've we've hung out with Larry a couple times, and we always have good laughs. And uh, he's such a gentleman. Uh, he he met my wife, and he took his hat off. And <laughs> you just don't see that anymore, you know. I was like, no. wow, that guy's classy. No, he, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna agree. Yeah, he definitely is. Yeah. So, where are you from, Gene? I am born and raised in Idaho. Um, started out in a small town right outside of Boise, and moved into Boise when I was a little bit older and right in the Boise area. Uh, 
went to school elsewhere in California, mm-hmm. and I was not a fan of the California life. So the second I graduated, the only jobs I applied for were back in Idaho. I missed the mountains too much. Gotcha. And what what didn't you like about California? Didn't I like? Well, one thing. Oh my God, it took. I wanted to go camping one weekend, and it felt like it took six hours, six to eight hours to get into the mountains. And I lived over on the coast, which was nice, but it was almost too monotonous. I want, I like, I like adverse temperatures. I like snow and blizzards and getting up in the hill. And, uh, it was a little bit too nice and a little bit too many people and, um, not exactly my type of people so much. Uh, you know, they're Californians, (laughs) which I don't want to piss Californians off. Oh, I shouldn't say that. Um, no, it was just, it was too big city. And mostly the closest place to go camping, the hardest problem I had is you either have to pay a fee or it's on asphalt or both. And I'm used to taking some back roads here in Idaho, you know, 30 minutes from where I live, taking a back road and plopping a tent down and not seeing anyone for three, four days. And in California, you just can't do that to get to the mountains. Like I said, we we're driving eight hours and, uh, that was it was a great place to go to school, but I was I really missed Idaho. Yeah. I love the mountains. Yes, yeah, so basically, when you walk out your door in Idaho, you're in the wilderness for the most part. It doesn't take long. No, it doesn't take long at all. It is beautiful, and I literally have walked out my door for a trail run and ran through a herd of elk one winter when they were pushed down from the snow. So. You just don't get that in California so much. No, you don't. You don't get that at all. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I guess if you grew up in that, that would be something you'd miss. And, you know, I've, I have relatives that moved to California and uh, they'll, they'll brag about how nice the weather is, but I don't get jealous. I'm like, no, I, I'm, I'm from New Hampshire. I, uh, I, I need the seasonal changes. I need some, some hot weather. I need some cool weather. I need some snow. I need... You know, these, uh, hum- I need the humidity in certain times of the year. I need the super dryness at other times. If I didn't yes. have that change, I would not enjoy myself. I don't want it to be 70 degrees every single day. That's exactly how it was. I felt like it was just too monotonous and I miss my seasons. I completely agree. Yeah, I'm with you. So what was life like in Idaho growing up? Well, It was, uh, I'm the youngest of three girls. So I have two older sisters and my dad, my, and my mom met in Alaska. My dad was a, he's a, you know, good old wilderness, outdoor hunting, fishing boy raised on a ranch. And they met in Alaska when they got pregnant, they moved to Idaho. And so I was the youngest. I was told I was always supposed to be the boy because they already had two girls. Hmm. So my very first memory is my sister's telling me, well, you sh- you were supposed to be the boy. So I remember um, wanting to cling on to that and be, a, be daddy's little girl. So I was very close with my father and I would beg him to always wake me up early, take, take me fishing, take me hunting. And we did a lot of that. We fished almost every weekend all summer long and come fall, he started, he'd, you know, it would be bird season and big game season. And, um, he was great about getting me out probably by the time I was five. Well, as long as early as I can remember, I'd go out and I'd just walk next to him while he was, uh, working his dogs and holding his shotgun, looking for pheasant. So it was fun. It was a lot of great childhood memories and, um, we had a very close family. Uh, did your sisters get into it as well, or were you the the person that, that kind of took over that role? They did a little bit when they were younger. Mm-hmm. I remember my oldest sister went on her first deer hunt, and I wasn't of age yet, and I was so upset. And then she came home, and she wasn't really overwhelmed, excited about it. And I was so jealous that I didn't get a go. Um, I don't know if she went more than once or twice. And then same with my middle sister, they kind of went, they tried it a little bit and no, I, I definitely clung to it. Anyone in my family would say that I was, uh, my dad's little hunting buddy and they they would, you know, even prefer sleeping in a little bit and I'd be up at dark wanting to get out in the car. Kind of like the, kind of like his hunting dogs, you know, (laughs) I, I'd hear it hear him turn the lights on when it's dark. And if he didn't wake me up, I'd be really mad. 
That's funny. Now, did did you care that your sisters weren't into it as much, or it, it's like I don't it didn't matter? No, it's not one. Not well, not something you think about as a kid. Um, I just it was really good quality time for me and my dad, and I actually thought that was pretty special. Mm-hmm. I knew that my sisters. I mean, they're very active too, and just different things. They were very athletic and into uh, yeah, you know, just different types of activities. Okay. So. Yeah. The hunting though for, was more of me and my dad. So I didn't care that they weren't in it. In fact, I kind of liked it because then it set me apart a little bit from them. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Is your dad still around? He is. Yes. Yeah. He still lives here sometimes. And then they've got a cabin over uh, near Salmon that they live in half time too. Okay. Right now he's in South Dakota bird hunting. Excellent. All right. So he's still, he's still going. Oh yeah. Yeah. He doesn't do any more big game hunting. He kind of quit that when I was in college because he got really into his dogs. He's, he's great with his Labradors and he's really into bird hunting. So he stopped big game hunting when I was in college. Okay. Now when I, we've talked a couple of times leading up to the show and there was a time I sent you a text and the text didn't come back in time or in a, a, a quick amount of time, like it normally would. And as I was getting some of the feed, I noticed that your phone got smashed. Somehow. Oh, that's right. Right. So, I, so it, it, it's, it, I get this sense and I have not asked you this question yet, but it sounds like you don't, you don't have an office job. Not all the time. No, thank goodness for that. No, I, I work for Idaho Fish and Game and I'm an engineer. So I get to, and I'm, I'm based in our headquarters in Boise, but I get to travel throughout the state and it's fabulous. I see some of the most beautiful places in, I think in the world, but that's my personal bias. Um, and I've, you know, born and raised in Idaho my whole life and got out with my dad quite a bit, but nothing like how I am able to with this job that I'm, uh, I work on fish habitat restoration projects primarily. Wow. So I go to pretty remote parts of the state and work with contractors and we're trying to restore some habitat and, um, I do a bit of travel. I have a six year old little boy, so I can't travel as much as I used to. And, um, I'm a single mom share custody. So I'm always here for my boy. But when I, when he's with his dad, then yeah, I usually go travel a little bit for work right. and the, that, yes, that time, uh, the excavator little literally ran over my phone and I was kind of, uh, SOL for a little bit. Gotcha. Yeah. It sounds like you're usually on a job site. Um, and, and so that's excellent. So now when I think of Idaho, I don't think of Idaho as needing fish restoration. Now what's going on there? Well, we're a very big agricultural state though. Okay. We've got ag and, right. ag and uh, yeah, ranching, mm-hmm. um, which is great. So, and we, you know, we used to have the gold rush came through and we had a whole bunch of hydraulic dredging and mining. So a lot of our country has been mm, disrupted, I would say, you know, um, we've got, uh, so one of the sites I worked on this summer was an old gold dredge site and they would, uh, run a, run the old gold dredge straight down the river channel. And this is where Chinook salmon and steelhead used to be very prevalent and spawn and are raised, but the habitat has been destroyed pretty much by these dredges. And so it takes a meandering river and it turns it into this straight fast ditch with piles of gravel on the side. So we, we do have some restoration work that's needed. Um, you know, especially we, we have dams and, um, the Columbia river has dams. So it blocks a lot of the salmon passage and so we work to restore the habitat so we still get some spawning and we still get salmon returns back in Idaho because our salmon are very important to us. They travel further than anywhere else in the whole country, further than even Alaska to get to Idaho. Oh, wow. Interesting. That's, cool. That's very cool. So what is it that you engineer to help the habitat of, of the Chinook salmon? Well, um, pretty much just almost like what mother nature intended it to be. So say that, for example, that straightened reach, Mm -hmm. we're putting more wood into it back before there were homesteads and ag fields all around it. It would be more forested. So by putting wood into the channel and stabilizing it so it doesn't go downstream, that provides a lot of, it slows the water down and it provides a lot of habitat and refugia for the fish to 
rust and also that organic material that wood brings brings bugs and insects and then all of a sudden you've got a really good trout fishery again and um cleans the water up a little bit because it holds back some sediment so a, a lot of the stuff i do is really just projects to put wood or meanders or you know remove some of these dikes that are on both sides of the river that the core used to dike up the rivers to so we could have big agricultural fields um, or ranches. Wow. It's a lot of fun. And we work with some fantastic landowners who get really excited because, you know, you'll talk to a landowner and um, they remember as a kid, these big salmon runs coming up through their property and grandpa used to catch salmon every day and, um, and they aren't there anymore. So it's kind of fun. Landowners get pretty excited about some of the stuff we do because it definitely does work to improve habitat and bring the salmon run back. That's fantastic. I had no idea that was going on in Idaho, but what a, what a great thing to be a part of when you look it back. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And it gets me outside, which I think is my therapy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it gets me to see some beautiful places too. So you get to be outside for work and see all these great places and then you play outside too. Well, hell fun. yeah. <laughs> if I'm going to have to go there for work, I'm going to have, I'm going to play a little bit while I'm there. <laughs> That's outstanding. So let's talk about some uh, elk hunting. I know you're, you're a big hunter and we talked a little bit and you said that you were more of an elk hunter than a deer hunter, although that you've taken your fair share of deer, but I'd like to kind of pick your brain about elk hunting is something I don't really know a darn thing about. Um, I don't live where elk live and it sounds like you just are in tune with the elk. So let's tell us a little bit about your philosophy of hunting. Like what is it about hunting that, that you need to have in your life? Let's start there. Oh, wow. There's a lot actually about why I hunt. Um, so, you know, I haven't always been in tune with the elk at all. In fact, it's been a really big learning curve. So my dad stopped hunting big game when I was in college. And so I actually, I did a lot of it myself and, um, I was married for five years, but he never really hunted. Actually, he never did hunt. And so, uh, he would prefer that I just go out by myself. And I really, I mean, I get out in the mountains and it's, it's spiritual to me. It's, it's like my church. I mentioned before, it's kind of my therapy. And I really do believe that. I think, I think we all could use a better connection with nature. And, um, sometimes, you know, when life isn't going the way you need it to be, uh, and we've all had our fair share of hardships, you get out in the mountains and it just, everything slows down. And then you see the animals too, and you see the sunsets and you live the life. And, and then also just the challenge of mother nature, because it's cold, you've got freezing temperatures and water is limited and just all the challenges of getting outdoors. Um, it's, it's, the main reason why I do it, it's not for the harvest. And then for me, elk hunting is, is it's just challenging. I actually, that's why I picked it up with a bow. I primarily archery elk hunt. And the reason I got into it was because I had heard some stories from, a, you know, coworkers about getting into these bugling bulls in the rut and they're so mad and frustrated and you can call them in. One guy you know, told me the story that was written up in Bugle magazine of he couldn't even come to full draw because a bull was just spitting and snorting right on him less than two yards away. He could touch it with his, the tip of his arrow and he couldn't even pull full draw. Wow. And intense. yeah. And you hear stories like that. And I don't know, I just think the whole connection with nature and, um, having those kind of experiences, what that's a memory for forever. And, you know, especially now that I had a son or just a child ever since I became a mom, you know, you want to, you want to raise your child with, with having the best of the memories that you had as your child. And I'm sorry, as in, in my childhood. And so my greatest memories growing up were really getting out with my dad and seeing animals. You know, I remember the first time we were just bird hunting and a porcupine walked next to me maybe 12 feet away. And I couldn't believe how big a porcupine was. And I still remember it to this day. And I probably was only five years old. And it's just, it's the memories like that, that I think are pivotal to a person and their growth. And it, 
you know, it, it teaches kids confidence and survival and self-reliance and all these lessons that you can, and respect that you can, that are important as a, you know, as an adult. So I, uh, I'm probably deviating from your question because now I'm going into my philosophy of why I hunt. No, no, that's good. But, um, it's, you know, it, I guess the urge came stronger after I became a mom and, um, I had married someone who, who didn't quite have those same, the hunting values that or the appreciation that I did. And for me, I just really wanted to become self-reliant so I could take my son hunting, just like my dad took me hunting and our marriage didn't last, but my, uh, sense of adventure and my want, my will to be more self-reliant just so you know, I can get my little boy on, I want to get him on an elk at 10 yards away when he's 12 years old. And, um, I'm not going to be able to do that if I don't know what I'm doing. So there were, I, I started archery elk hunting, actually just elk hunting in general. My first year I went out with a rifle. I went out for five years before I ever killed an animal. And it was just a lot about a learning process and, you know, and it was frustrating as hell. (laughs) I would come back and I wanted to get, I wanted to kill so bad. I almost even gave up because I was having trouble and, um, you know, I couldn't exactly find people that would go out with me. So I did a lot of it just by myself. And then I finally did meet some friends through some 3d archery shoots and went camping and hunting with them. And then I, that's when I got my first kill, which was great. It was in a tree stand and it was my very first spike elk. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's one of those skills I think is important and, and it's the kind of memories that you just remember forever. And that's the kind of bond I want to have with my own son. So gotcha. I, yeah, I just get out so I can experience and get better so I can teach him. So over the last so many years, it took you what five years before you've kind of figured it out what were some of the things that you realized you were kind of making mistakes doing and had to correct where there's some things that stuck out in your mind a little bit more than others. Yeah. I, there was always a big learning curve. Um, well, like I said, I, I grew up big game hunting, but it was always deer hunting with my dad. So elk hunting is, it's just, it's a whole different mm, thing, especially archery hunting. Cause I've never done that. So I completely, you know, um, taught myself how to bow hunt with some help from some coworkers, on just lessons, but I was out there by myself and really a lot of it is wind, you know, keeping the wind to your face, um, being quiet, looking for sign, uh, getting in the right spots and then glassing. A lot of the work is just done glassing and you have to be willing to hike and climb and get into some of the stuff that I've gone in, you know, like (laughs) my thought is from some of the books I've read that the elk are in the steepest, nastiest timber that you'll ever want to get into. And so that's a lot of the stuff I hunt too, because I'm looking for them. Um, so, you know, I've, I've definitely gotten a lot better over the years and, uh, it's just, it's a lot of fun. I've had some great elk encounters too, which is fantastic. One of the best ones I actually just had on Saturday. Let's talk about that, uh, that encounter seeing it so fresh in your mind. You want to take us through a little elk hunt with you? Yeah, that was fantastic. So I didn't harvest in my archery season. And in Idaho, we have the tag that I bought. You have the month of September to archery hunt. And I got into some bulls, never quite something that I really wanted to take um, or the right opportunity to, you know, that came out to get an archery kill or an ethical shot. So I didn't harvest. And then on this tag, you have two weeks of a muzzleloader hunt, um, which is open right now. So I've, sh- I've hunted with a muzzleloader before. It was a borrowed gun from a coworker and I've tried it, but I've decided that I really wanted to harvest an elk this year. So I bought one for myself and went out. Um, it, I was actually working my job sites. I, I bought my tag in the area that I've got a construction job on near the Salmon River excuse me. And so I was going out in the mornings and in the evenings and, um, I took a couple coworkers with me and we started, you know, I was learning the patterns a little bit and then a couple evenings I would just go out by myself. But on Saturday I went out by myself and, uh, started 
hiking up the hill where the draw that I knew I've seen the elk, you know, and there was actually quite a decent amount of, we all, we saw over a hundred head one morning coming out of this ag field, climbing up this hill. So that's where I went Saturday morning and I just started hiking and I got up, I was up there in dark and left my car and pitch black with a headlamp and just started hiking up the hill. Cause I knew that they, you know, I had seen them the day before. So hike on up and, uh, get into this ridge of, well, I, I stopped and glassed and scoped and saw some, and it probably wasn't nine 30 or 10 now, but so the sun's up and I'm crossing over this ridge where I think they are. And as soon as I get over this ridge, you know, I've been climbing a lot. So I kind of take my shirt off, air things off, take a rest, get a sip of water and um, then I start hearing a bull bugle. So I quickly scramble, get my everything back in my pack. <laughs> and then I hear another bull sound off. And they're in this little valley that I'm in. One's on the other, the far ridge. One's below me. And then a third one goes off above me. So I spray myself down and, you know, that no scent spray. Yeah. And uh, put my things back in my pack, put my backpack back on and hike up the this trail. And it's a pretty evident elk trail there. I, and then actually that's when the bull right above me sounded off and he sounded like he was only 150 yards away. Um, and I've practiced my muzzleloader, so I feel pretty comfortable up to about a hundred, but it's a cow only tag an antlerless tag. So, you know, if I would have been into bulls like that in archery season, that would have been fantastic. But of course, once you get into the bulls, the only tag you have in your pocket is the cow tag. So Anyway, I, um, I jump off the trail cause I figure the cows have, or the bulls have cows with them jump off the trail. I only go 18 yards off the trail and I hide up behind this tree and lay down a couple cow calls. And sure enough, this young elk starts coming up the trail and he just, you know, he, he responds to great to my cow calls. He comes running in, um, right in my view, it was a 17 and a half yard shot with my muzzle loader. And I smoked him. Wow. It was actually, it turned out to be a small bull, but he was still legal because his antlers were so small. So it's still antlerless. But uh, yeah, 17 and a half yards. And I was thrilled. I start calling my buddy down in Salmon, my coworker, so he and his wife can come up and make a couple phone calls and go over. And, you know, then I'm like trying to, trying to position this dead elk so I can take some selfies. <laughs> right. And you probably saw my post too <clears throat> that morning. So I, I was trying to take some selfies with this dead elk and I can still hear these bulls going off around me. Mm. So I, uh, text my buddy, he's just arrived, you know, bringing my truck to the bottom of the hill and they're starting their hike up. And, um, I lay down a, a few more cow calls and sure enough, this, uh, this bull starts walking up and he just walks up the trail and he was a pretty nice five by five. I mean, he's, you know, a small five point, but it's hell. I would have shot him in archery season in a second. Right. <laughs> and he comes up the trail and I'm just laying there right next to my cow and good thing. I flipped my phone on record. So I got video of him coming up the trail yeah. and right next to us, he was, he was probably about three and a half yards away, less than like 10 feet, 10 feet away from me. And he just walks right past us, kind of sniffs in the air a little bit. And I had just been laying down by my cow. And even on the video, you can see a dead cow in the forefront. And then this big bull walk right past in the, in the background. And, you know, it, it, it was just really cool to see an elk like that just come right up the trail and it never even got scared. He just kind of wandered up a little bit further, smelled in the air, licked in the air and then kept going. It was, yeah, it was pretty phenomenal. That's you know, that just, just doesn't happen every day. It doesn't happen every day in my life. I can tell you that. <laughs> That's amazing. So, I mean, and this, this is just part of the Idaho culture, right? I mean, as a, as a resident, the, 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 the tags must be cheaper or more available. Is that correct? Yeah. Tags here are not very expensive at all. I actually had bought a second tag too, which, and second tags, you have to pay non-resident fees, but even non-resident fees, it was maybe 400 bucks. Hmm. It's not terrible. Um, but yeah, for a resident, uh, I buy a whole sportsman's package each year. So I don't actually know what the individual elk tag is. But I get the sportsman's package, which comes with your wolf tag, your cougar tag, your bear tag, turkey, salmon permits, um, you know, the whole nine yards fishing, hunting combo. That's 
Now, <laughs> I'm just trying to visualize this because that's not anything I see on my my bullet list on my hunting license at all. Um, and it's just a different, totally different concept of hunting compared to what I'm used to. We, oh, but that's fantastic. What a great rundown that you can just over the counter as a resident hunter go get that. Oh yeah, and I think that altogether only cost me like maybe 150 bucks, 157 I think is what the sportsman's package is. That's wow. crazy. That's well, crazy. then we have to buy we do have to buy our individual tags. But I think no, actually I think that comes with the tags. Sometimes you have to buy tags. Uh but no, in general, it's about 160 bucks to get all those animals. Wow. So are there that Go ahead. I was going to say, not that I've harvested all of them, but, you know, I like to have them in my pocket because if I'm out there elk hunting and a cougar comes by with my bow, that would be quite the, quite the, quite the kill. And yeah. I'd happily take it. Absolutely. So what, what is, I mean, are there that many elk in Idaho or have I just not, not ever realized this? We do have a pretty decent population, but you know, it's, uh, if I made it sound easy, I probably shouldn't have. I went out, I don't know how many days I went out in September because of my job and my son. I think I only was able to go out maybe 10, 11 days the month of September, Mm -hmm. but I was hunting hard and up in the mountains and I had scouted in August and I, you know, it was a hot September. The animals weren't active. They weren't bugling. And, uh, it was, it was a challenging September all around the state for archery hunters so I didn't harvest. It's definitely not ever guaranteed, but you know, nothing in hunting is guaranteed. Um, it just happens to be that I, I've been hunting this unit now for, oh, and scouting it since August. So I finally in muzzleloader season, finally located where a decent population was hanging out. Okay. So no, it's, it's tricky. Like I said, it took me five years before I ever killed an animal. So there, you know, these, that's why that encounter was so spectacular for me because, um, seeing an elk walk within 10 feet of you, that, that doesn't happen to a lot of people. No, no, definitely not. That's a great experience. So, okay. So now because we are the, the big buck registry, let's, let's kind of transition away from elk hunting a little bit and talk about some deer hunting and how elk hunting and deer hunting are similar or maybe some of the techniques that you use are similar and some of the things that aren't let's, let's start there. So what, what's the, what are some of the similarities that you can draw from your experiences in Idaho between elk hunting and mule deer hunting, for example? Well, I think with, um, you know, big mule deer hunting around here, you still have to do quite a bit of scouting. We have some really nice trophy mule deer and, I have a couple of friends that go after those pretty heavy each year. And, uh, you know, there, those, there's controlled hunts for those, um, areas too. Sometimes you can get lucky with an over the counter general season harvest tag or, you know, harvest, but we do have controlled hunts for our areas where we manage for larger mule deer. And, you know, the same sort of work ethic is going to go into it, um, for any, large animal like that. Uh, a lot of scouting, a lot of time glassing and sometimes a lot of hiking and climbing as well too. Hmm. Although mule deer, we have a decent population closer to our desert too. So it's not always in the, up in the timber and the mountain areas where I usually hunt. Um, we have, we have a pretty good population lower down in some of the warmer country. Okay. So Idaho is, is, can, is diverse in some of its terrain, it sounds like. Oh, extremely diverse. Yeah. You go up north up by Canada and it's almost, um, rainforest. They get so much precipitation and down here in the, uh, well, I live in Boise, but you know, in some parts of the States, it can be less than eight inches of rain Hmm. and we are more high desert plateau. So, and then you go down South and you're in the Oahe desert. So it's, yeah, it's extremely diverse, which is one of the things I love about it too. Wow. That's fantastic. All right. So what are some of the differences between elk hunting and mule deer, mule deer hunting? Well, uh, probably the terrain and I'm more experienced with bow hunting for elk. So, and I, you know, the, the deer that I've taken with my bow was late season archery. So I have taken a couple deer with my bow, but it was more late season in December 
when um, the the animals come down a little bit lower out of the hills. Uh, you know, they're they're usually in different areas. You don't find your elk herds in the same zones you find your mule deer. Um, the ruts are different. The timing of the rut uh, in September, elk are going crazy. Well, usually this year it was a little bit later. Um, the deer, their rut is later in the year, later in the fall. And, you know, just their, their behavior, uh, patterns. Again, I'm not a, I'm not an avid, I mean, I love mule deer, but I've just never really hunted big bucks a whole lot. So Mm -hmm. I can't speak from experience too much on that one. Well, that's okay. I mean, I think hunting an elk kind of replaces that in a lot of ways because elk are, I mean, let's face it, it's probably one of the pinnacle hunts that you could do in North America when it comes down to it. I can't think of anything that necessarily tops that when it comes to a big game species other than maybe a moose. Um, Yeah, I was thinking maybe moose, but. Right. But as far as the interaction, the sounds that they make, um, the, the, the type of hunting you have to do, it's almost like combining big buck hunting with turkey hunting in a lot of ways. And it just, the terrain's totally different. Yeah. I would actually say turkey hunting and elk hunting are very similar too, because you call the males and they usually can respond. Um, and with mule deer, from what I understand about big bucks, you know, they're, they're not as easy to locate. You have to do a lot more glassing sometimes with elk because they do have such a loud bugle. Um, you can locate them maybe a little bit easier if you're in the right terrain. Right. And I have to be honest, I guess if I, if I had elk at my, uh, not fingertips or disposal necessarily, but if I had elk readily available through my tag, I think I'd focus on elk hunting more than deer hunting too. <laughs> Dusty, it is what, pretty, what do you have to say fun. about that, Dusty? Would you do that as well? I, absolutely. You know, it, it's one of the things where the, the, the value of the arrow that flies is going to be more for the elk meat versus the deer meat. Right. That makes sense? Yeah. I think if I if I was surrounded by elk, I'd go after elk too. Yeah, and just uh, all that effort you put into it, and th- there's a huge reward with the elk. Mm-hmm. It sounds, you know, you know, one's meat and another skill level to be able to harvest a nice mature elk. Right, because you're still using the same techniques. You're still, or a lot of the techniques, the same gear. Sounds like let's. Oh speak, yeah. Speaking of gear, let's uh, Dusty. Can you let's let's take and 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 kind of pick Jean's brain about what she prepares herself for the field. What kind of things are in the pack? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. Um, I, I want to ask a quick question, Gene. That just a curiosity: when you go mule deer hunting, hunting or elk hunting, do, do you guys switch your bow set up pretty? What do you do there? No, actually, I don't. I keep it all the same because that's how I practice with it. And you know, I use I practice with field tips all year round, and then come about August, a month before I start hunting, I'll start sighting in broadheads. And then once I've got my broadhead sighted in. No, it's I I hunt that way through September for elk and then I don't touch my bow still again when I do my late season archery deer hunt as well. So I use the same exact setup. I don't like to change my bow setup. Once I get it on, I like to keep it on. All right, let's talk a little bit about your bow setup. Tell us what kind of bow you're shooting. I shoot the Matthews Jewel and I really like it. It's it's been uh fabulous for me so far. It's um I shot when I was shopping for that one. I did shoot other bows. I shot the Hoyt and the Bowtech, but something about the you know the Matthews cam system just fit me better. And I had a girlfriend who shot the Hoyt, and it's just the you know for her she loved hers and me I loved mine. It's just the cam setup is a little bit different, and uh, it's got a it's got a nice little hold back, and I really like my Matthews jewel. Gotcha. I'm assuming that you're shooting carbon fiber arrows. Is that correct? I am. Yes. What kind of broadhead are you tipping your arrows with? <laughs> Funny you ask that because I, I'm shooting the same broadheads that I started hunting with, which, you know, they're just the Cabela's brand copperhead broadheads. And people ask me that, like, you know, I should maybe upgrade my broadheads and shoot something fancier or more expensive. But it's one of those things that they're always on and I've killed animals with them and I'm almost, it might even be a little superstition. I'm kind of scared to change my broadheads because they fly so great compared to my field tips. So usually when I go from field tips to broadheads, when I shoot those just Cabela's brand copperhead, it 
transitions right over. So I guess I'm, I've always been hesitant, but I have been, I've gotten feedback that at some point I should really, you know, try different broadheads that might be more expensive or more accurate. I don't know, but so far I've had really good luck with the generic Cabela's brand. Yeah. And you got to go with what works for you. Exactly. Um, let's get into a little bit about what you pack when you're going out on a elk hunt in particular. Can you tell us about what you set out to pack in your backpack on before you trip? Yeah. So, um, one thing that I always carry, you know, I mentioned I hunt solo a lot too. Um, I, we all have to know our own limitations and one of my weaknesses is, general sense of direction. I will say when I'm in the mountains and I've got timber all around and the sun's moving, I always carry a GPS. That is probably my standby. You know, I'll mark, I'll mark a GPS point for my car. I turn my tracks on. That's the last thing I want to do is get lost out there. And so, um, I just have a little handheld GPS that I rely heavily on. And then, you know, I, I've got a, uh, slumberjack pack and I keep my, I always have a, an emergency first aid kit and your typical first aid gear, just because you never know what might happen. And if you ever have to spend the night, like a small emergency blanket, I do bring cord and knives and even a bone saw. Um, it was just when I was cleaning my elk this weekend, the guy with me, he's like, you use a bone saw. You don't need a bone saw, but I know that I am female and I'm not quite as, uh, strong as some of my male counterparts who hunt. So I have no problems carrying a bone saw around it's a lightweight little Wyoming saw and knowing that it's going to be the right tool for the job. If I'm out there by myself, it helps to have. And, uh, I mentioned cord in case I have to hang up quarters. Um, you know, obviously your, your food, I'm always carrying my, uh, I have a couple different reed diaphragm cow calls and a bugle, um, which I try not to use too much, but I'm starting to learn it a little bit better. I've been messing around with different bugle tubes too, which has been helpful. Uh, let's see. And then, you know, you're, well, I'm, I'm thinking knives, GPS, emergency kit, adventure kit, um, first aid kit, I mean, and uh, extra gloves, extra hats, those little, what are they, uh, those little heat warmers, you know, heat, Heat, heat pads for your feet and your gloves, just in case I do get caught out in a cold night. And then of course your matches. I probably have waterproof matches. I have two things of Flint. I carry this little, um, fire starter kit that has the homemade, I don't know if you've heard this trick, uh, you probably have, but it, cotton balls with petroleum jelly smeared all around them. Hmm. I keep those in a little pill box in my pack, just in case I have to ever build a fire and that petroleum jelly starts on fire like nothing else no um yes yeah, so that's my little emergency in case i ever have to build a fire for myself hmm. and um i think that's 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 the you know then your essentials like food and chapstick and uh i carry a little bit of water but i also because i'm female too i don't like to have a huge heavy pack i carry uh a standard like one liter water bottle that has a filter on it. So I may carry only one or two liters of water, but then I also carry this little uh, filter bottle so I can just filter water when I'm out too. That's quite a pack. That's a great pack. I like the petroleum jelly trick. I have not, uh, I've never had to do that, but I didn't know that Vaseline burned like it did. So I'll, I'll, that's uh, that's a great idea. Oh yeah. It's that petroleum in there. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> Interesting. Let's get in a little bit about uh, what what kind of camouflage do you wear as a female hunter? You know, I've gone through different different stuff, different clothing, and um, that's a good question because there's not a whole lot out there for females. And the stuff that there that is out there for me, I'm almost five nine, five eight and a half, and I've got pretty long legs. I have trouble with the the female clothes because they seem like they're a little bit short. This year I got into cryptic pants and cryptic gear. Uh, I use the Highlander camo pattern. And man, I tell you, for being a long legged female, those cryptic pants fit better than any pants I've ever tried on, including, you know, some of the some of the stuff that's geared towards women. They they may have, you know, your standard male pants have maybe a little bit higher waist, but uh 
these ones fit me perfect. I love them. So I'm not a fan of the female clothing gear. I kind of look at cryptic more as a, yeah, that's my gear. So I like their Highlander pattern. I've had a lot of fun with that. And, um, that's what I use. Very cool. So yeah, it makes it nice to hear that uh, you found some clothing that actually fits a female hunter. And that's something that's very valuable for a few of our listeners. Yeah, I I have definitely gone through my share of different clothing and it gets expensive. So it's nice to find something that fits well. So yeah, for sure. Good deal. Gotcha. So Gene, let's talk about the extreme huntress competition a little bit before I get into my closing questions. So you, you're, you've, you're in first or second place. You've made it through a couple of rounds. Um, and, but there's also this voting component, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah. As of now, I think we've played five episodes and I scored first in the first round and tied for second in the second. Um, the, and those are just the skill classifications or the skill scores. That's 30%, but there is this voting component, which is another 30%. Okay. And then the judges account for 40%, and we don't know the judges' scores because they kept them to themselves, and they were judging you know, the whole competition, primarily our hunts and our hunting style and um, ethics and skills while we were hunting. Okay. And where, when does the voting end? The voting doesn't end until all the episodes have aired. Okay. So there is a new round of voting with each episode. And the episodes air Mondays and Thursdays, 8.30 Eastern. And they've had some technical difficulties. But what's supposed to happen is that when they air the episode on those Mondays and Thursdays, then the voting goes back down to zero. And then each, you know, people can vote for their favorite huntress following each episode. And it's going to go on. Uh, well, I, they've told us 13 weeks, so 26 episodes twice a week, 13 weeks through December. And then that would be the end of the voting. Actually, I think we can vote all the way up until January 1st and then they turn the voting off. And, uh, so even by January 1st, we wouldn't have a perfect idea of the winner because the judges withhold their scores and their, they account for 40%. So we actually don't find out who wins until, we go back down to Dallas for the annual Dallas Safari Club convention, yep. which I've never attended yet. I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I hear it's rather large. And uh, the Saturday night banquet, I've been told that they get us up on stage and then they announce the winner at that point. Very cool. Now, where would we go to vote? Do, you, do they give you a web address or anything like that? Yeah, it's the same address to watch the series. Okay. So it is www.extremehuntress dot com. Okay. And that's just spelled out. And also there's links through my Facebook page too. <laughs> okay. Cause I do try to promote it, you know, every time we've got a series coming out, an episode coming out, cause I've got friends who don't go on the website. So I'll just put a plug, Hey, there's a new episode out here it is. And, uh, it's yeah, it's, but it's extreme com, And then you can watch the episodes from the homepage and then there's also a vote now button that you can hit and it brings up all six of us shows, uh, you know, the vote numbers and then you can vote at that point. Okay. What do you, do you like your odds or your chances of winning this thing? <laughs> oh, I'm going to kick everyone's ass. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like that attitude. Very nice. All no, right. the voting has not been, you know, super favorable for me because, uh, well, I think just that other people are more socially, social media linked, I should say. Before this, I didn't really have much of a Facebook account or um, Instagram, and so I'm I'm trying to grow that. But um, yeah, I, Texas went good. It was a lot of fun, and I did okay. So uh, I'm hoping that I get a good amount of voting support, and I'm in the running. Excellent. All right. Well, we're pulling for you, as we have pulled for certain huntresses in the past. Uh, you're number one on our list, just so you know. Oh, thank you. So, Gene, if you had one hunting tip to share with the world that's the best tip of all time, that you consider the best of all time, what would that one hunting tip be? Hmm. Just one, huh? Just one. I would – what I always tell myself and even went through my head this weekend is be patient but be aggressive because sometimes you have to – act quickly 
And there's been many opportunities where, you know, <laughs> patience and aggressive aggression usually don't go hand in hand, but um, you have to know when to do either. And a lot of times you're just going to have to sit something out and wait, sit animals out. But then sometimes you can't sit too long. So I guess that's probably not the best tip, but it's something to think about. And that was running through my head all day on Saturday is be patient, but be aggressive. And, uh, you know, it, that kind of just comes with experience with your animals too, of what you're hunting. Um, you have to know their, their behavior patterns. So I would probably say that. And then obviously know your limitations being a female hunter. Don't go backpacking and shoot an elk eight miles in thinking that you can strap it to your back and haul it out in two or three different packs. Uh, I, I think as a female hunter, some it's more important for us to know our limitations. And that's that comes in mind a lot for me. Like if I'm solo hunting, I try not to go too far in the back country and I try not to go too far out of cell service because the last thing I want to do is get an 800 pound bull down and I mean, not have the resources to be able to bring the meat home safely. Gotcha. No, that's a great tip. And that's a problem that elk hunters would face, um, but deer hunters may not because of the, the, the size of the animal. In a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, that's great. Um, is the, you said you, you, you read a little bit. Is there a book that you like to reference that taught you more about hunting than any other book? <laughs> um, yeah. When I first was trying to learn, I would get some CDs, some DVDs. You know, Corey Jacobson has some great elk hunting tip um, blogs and DVDs. And he's also from Idaho, the world champion elk caller. And I've gone to a couple of his seminars, but one book that goes way back from when I first wanted to do it, it was actually from Mike Eastman, The Eastman Way, Elk Hunting the West. And I've studied that book and I've taken it and sat in tree stands and blinds with it. And it's just called Elk Hunting the West, The Eastman Way by Mike Eastman. Okay. And that's that's been good. And then, you know, I've kind of followed Cameron Haynes a little bit and Cam Haynes has a, a backcountry bow hunting book that's has some good tips too. Okay. Very nice. All right. So is there a thing, an item, a good luck charm, a pacifier, whatever you want to call it, that you have to take into the woods with you or you just feel naked without it? What's that one thing for you? Hmm. I'm trying to think. I think the only thing I rely heavily on really, I'm not a superstitious person, but I, I always have to have my GPS. (laughs) And yep. I told you my sense of direction is not the best. Um, so no, just my, just my GPS. And actually part of the reason I like being out so much is that you, you have those challenges and you don't have a thing to cling on to. It's just you and nature and the animals and your own survival skills. So other than, uh, not getting lost, um, no, I just enjoy the time by myself and, a little time to reflect and slow the world down a little bit. Nice. I like that. It's a good answer. And finally, what would the Gene McFall of today tell the Gene McFall from 20 years ago, knowing what you know today? Hmm. I think I probably would have told myself uh, to try to get in some, um, get into some, you know, we have such a great community of hunters and I didn't quite realize it. I didn't find it until later in my hunting career. And, you know, um, some of these seminars and even just hunting films that come to town, uh, uh, Boise, as I'm sure a lot of places in this nation have really great hunting communities. And I didn't, I wasn't really aware of it until I, you know, people got behind me on this competition and local folks and, um, you know, local names that I've known that are great hunters have come out and supported me. And man, 20 years ago, I wish I would have just had the know with all to go find those resources and, and go to the archery shops or go to the 3d shoots and just kick dirt with these hunters. And kind of, I think I would have learned a little quicker from other people's experience since my dad never took me elk hunting and elk hunting was, you know, pretty much a self-taught discipline to me. I really should have just gone and talked to people that do it a little bit more instead of relying on just books and, and CDs. But that's kind of the engineer inside of me. And, um, 
uh, it took me a little while to open up and, and, you know, talk hunt it with people. And I should have just done that to, in the beginning and not worried what people thought about being this, uh, woman who wants to try to learn how to hunt. I think some of the men I used to talk to, they thought it was just more of an oddity, but it, it really is within me. So I should have just had the confidence to go talk to the rest of the guys when they're all showing their hunting stories and hunting pictures. And I should have just walked right up and, and shot the shit with the rest of them. And I could have learned a lot quicker, I think. Right. Uh, I, I agree. There's, there's a whole resource out there that's not in a book. Uh, and you can, it's accessible. You just have to go get it. Dusty, do you have any last questions for Gene? Uh, no, I don't, Jay. Uh, you guys pretty much covered a lot of things. Okay. Very good. Well, Gene, thanks for joining us on the Big Buck podcast. It's been a pleasure. And thanks for taking us elk hunting. So, uh, that, that was our, our first voyage to Idaho and talked about that in depth. So thank you for that. Thanks for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I, I could listen to Jean talk all day. She's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Very, very informal and you know, very educational and, and, and seems to really know her way through the, the Idaho woods. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I learn stuff because that's not a familiar area to me. Like, I don't know Western hunting, no Eastern hunting. And I'm always fascinated about how, you know, you're talking about some serious elevations out there. And they just kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, it's not my back door. And they don't, they don't, it's not a big deal to them. But to me, I'm like, wow, that's it's amazing. You're in big country right away. Yeah, that, that's the cool part about the Big Buck Rice Your Deer Hunting Podcast. We, we venture all over the spectra and, and getting into some unknown areas that me or you really have no clue about. But, uh, you know, I learn a lot. And actually, you know, by learning from these podcasts from different areas, if I was ever to book a hunt in, in Idaho, I, I could listen to this over and over and really get some information that I could take with me out there and, and be uh, more, uh, a higher percentage of success. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to educate yourself simply by using this fantastic format that we have discovered and participate in a weekly basis called podcasting and we're just going to keep doing it every single week so dusty what do you have for me for the chubby tines tip of the week you know i'm going to get into uh, a little bit about uh, a, a whitetail buck and i, I want to tell a story that stuck with me for a long time and i see it year after year and you know as, as the rut gets closer and it's going to take me a minute to give this tip off jay but we're going to knock it out and then it's going to be very useful for a lot of hunters okay you know years ago I, I i wanted to educate myself a little more on rattling and grunt calling and you know something that i i was able to pick up from all that that really educated me was the the fact that a buck when you start rattling and grunting if he can't get a visual on you say you see a buck 50, 75 yards away, and you know he can't get a visual on you, but you're able to see him and, and be able to get a good look at what he's doing as you're grunting or rattling. Uh, you know, obviously, once the deer gets close, you can't rattle anymore, but that grunt call really plays a huge role in, in your success on bringing him closer. And as over time, I was able to grunt in some some very nice bucks, you know, a rattling sequence, see him coming through the woods and start to get in that grunt call and something that educated me the most was when that deer started licking his, putting his tongue out and licking his lips and getting his nose really moist. You know, and over time, I started realizing that what he's trying to do is is determine what buck's making that grunt sound by the taste and the smells and the, the molecules in the air of that particular buck. Now, you know, once that buck started licking his lips, his curiosity, that, that to me is curiosity really become focused on trying to figure out what buck that was making that sound. And it seemed like the more you grunted, the more he started licking his lips. Then he started walking towards me a little bit. And then he would start trying to make rubs and some scrapes. And he would start showing the activity of a, a buck and rut that's coming after whatever it is that's grunting. Now this, you know, primarily has worked on mature bucks. And this is where I've really seen that focal point of the licking the, the mouth with his tongue, trying to scent what buck's making that grunt sound. And once he committed to me, the more I grunted, and you know, I, I didn't just lay on the grunt call, lay on the grunt call, but uh, as he was coming, he was licking his lips, he was scraping on some on the ground, he was making some rubs, and almost like he was trying to make some licking branches. Yep. And I don't know if that was to clean his nose, uh, put some different smell on his nose, and then he would lick his lip, lick lick his lips, and 
try to pick up some scent in the air. But that buck reacted uh, just like that, you know, a lot of tongue action coming out of the mouth, going up to the nasal passages and putting the moisture on the on the, on the the pad of the nose. And uh, o- over the years, that, that that's something that I really f- focused on. When you can get a buck to start doing that, that means that uh, the curiosity level is super high, the aggressiveness is super high, and, he, and he's going to actually try to walk, get a little bit downwind of that grunt. And, and, and that's time to you know take advantage of what uh, the opportunity to make the shot for that buck with his curiosity, getting himself killed. That's awesome, man. That's a great tip. And that's some stuff that uh, you don't get to see all the time when you're out there. But if you do start to see that, that indicator, man, look out. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, it's almost like their their way to inform you that they're very interested and and they their curiosity just blows your mind that, that they got to figure out what deer that is, you know. Yeah, I've um, ki- I've killed a deer that way, and now listening to you talk, li- seeing some other people talk about that one aspect, I didn't really know what I was doing at that time, but I did exactly that, and it worked. And it's it got to the point where they got close enough for the shot, and it took about an hour and a half before it actually developed some of the thickest stuff known to man. But you could see the the licking occurring because it was curious; it wanted to know what that other buck was. Yeah, and you know, and, and deer can naturally uh, identify the scent of the other buck in the area. You know, if you've got a mature buck, he can identify another mature buck or a buck period yeah. just by picking up the scent of it, you know, and they're around each other enough that they're, you know, their, their brain and mind, uh, you know, they remember and, and be able to identify what that smell is. And it's, it's really interesting to see a mature buck do that. And, you know, uh, the best of luck to everybody that they, they get in a scenario where they can witness this. And it really educates you on what the process of identification is with a mature white tail. Yeah, I, it was one of the greatest hunts that I've ever been on. You know, it was something that occurred almost identical to what you described. Just just a great hunt. And now yeah. Now I understand it. Yeah, it's a very cool experience. And I'm telling you, if you pay attention and you you, you pick up on that, and, and I, I'm just, I, I want to put that out there because the ruts, you know, the ruts here, and this is something that's going to work. And, and I'm hoping that somebody listens to the podcast and, and is able to focus in on this particular tip and really capitalize on the opportunity that it's given you. Yes, very much so. A great tip, Dusty. Though. Very, 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 very good tip. So where can we find you, Dusty, when you're not here hanging out with me on this microphone? Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. You can also look up Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Gobbler. And if uh, you're interested in looking me up on Instagram, you can go and I'm at Chasing Antler. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Best place to reach me is jay at bigbuckregistry.com. That's my email address. That'll get to me directly. You can find our entire Facebook contingent on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. And if you'd like to register a deer, uh, you can give us a call at 724-613-2825, just like our guest did today. And if you'd like to get it featured on the Facebook page and be famous for a day in front of 178,000-plus fans, you can go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash mybuck. All the instructions will be right there for you to follow and uh, get that, that picture of that great buck over to us. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. And if you would, if you're a, a subscriber, you can actually subscribe to the show. Or if you're not, if you're a non-subscriber, you can subscribe to the show by hitting the subscribe button right there on your iDevice. Or if you like the show enough and you want to give us a five-star review, you can do a search for Big Buck Registry and give us a review on iTunes. Also, one of the things I want to let you know that's coming out, and we've just got this all set up, Google. Google is getting into the podcast distribution system uh, where they are actually going to be distributing podcasts just like Apple does. And that's going to be huge for all podcasters. So be on the, uh, we've already uploaded our, our feed and that'll be coming out soon. I don't know exactly when they're going to launch, but uh, podcasting is now on the Google platform and will be available to consumers probably within the next month. So stay tuned for that if you're an Android user or if you just want to listen to this show on your computer. But certainly, you know, Apple's one way to listen to this show and an Android phone, a Google phone, will be the other way. And because Google has decided to play ball, it's going to be huge, absolutely huge. So stay tuned for that. And I think that's a show, Dusty. 
Big Buck, Big Buck, everywhere out. Big Buck. Excellent. Well, I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. I will actually see you next week, Jay. Yes, sir, you will. And I can't wait. Wait.